Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have... Aaron P.T. Canning. Yeah, it was great, y'all. It was great. It was yeah. a long interview, so we're, so our intro will be shorter than normal because uh, she's got such great things to say. Mm-hmm. But we do yeah. have supporters. We do. We do have some new, new supporters, supporters this week. Thank so, you, guys. Yeah, we're thankful that you've come on board with us, and we appreciate your support. Yeah. Yeah. The first one is Doug Chalquist. Uh, he has the tent and Doug, I hope we said that right. We spent 10 minutes trying to figure out how to pronounce it. <laughs> so if we said it wrong, we're so sorry. Yeah, we're so sorry, but we did make an effort. So yeah, thanks for supporting us, Doug. Yeah. Up next, we have Amanda Hawkins and she picked the heart. Is her emoji? Yes. And we have Shelly Marsh and she picked the heart as well. So thanks again. Yes. Thanks to everybody. And if you support the podcast, um, we did release a episode about um, beginnings, openings, writing hooky openings for your book. And that is in the podcast feed. If you signed up to support us, you should have received an email from Buzzcast or Buzzsprout support with a private link that you can download and get those podcasts. If you don't have that, just email support at buzzsprout.com and they will resend it to you. And that's how you get the special episodes. Okay. That's yeah. really great. Yeah. Uh, anything big going on with you? Uh, not a whole lot. Um, this week, I, or actually we're recording this on Monday. And so yeah. normally we would record it the week before, but yeah. last week I did a bunch of, um, I am doing my writing still, getting some good. words in first, which is very good. good. Yeah, And I am uh, I found a, a uh, place that will do 1099s for you because you know like you're supposed to send out 20 yeah. 1099s yeah. by the end of this like yeah. by the day this goes out yeah. it will be like the day that you should have sent them yeah. out if you yeah. haven't done it yet but um dropbox has a thing called form swift and you can go on sign up for a trial and do your 1099s and if you you can cancel within seven days and it's free so i tried it out it worked great so if anybody needs 1099s you get them there and they're pretty easy so i've been doing some stuff like that admin stuff and i'm offloading a bunch of things uh to adriel she's going to help me with this year and it's a lot of getting things in place so that it will run later but it's a lot of getting things in place right now yeah i'm i'm in the process of uh migrating my newsletter to a different server Mm -hmm. um just to save money because I'm not really making as much, you know, as much. Yeah. And um, I was, I've been with MailChimp. I've been needing to do this. I believe I've even talked about it before, but I mean, I just have to do it. And uh, I, so Adrian's going to help me with that. And I don't know. I mean, Flowdesk is so tempting because it's so inexpensive, but BookFunnel doesn't integrate with them. Mm-hmm. And, and that's pretty important. It's so important. I mean, like I, you can go in and get your files, but I like not having to think about it. Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to go with mail or light. It's, it's, it, you know, it's not cheap at all, but it is less than I would be paying on MailChimp because mm-hmm. my newsletter is pretty big. So, um, <clears throat> so I think that's really what I'm doing. And, um, yeah. So um, I did get bangs. I think I mentioned that. And all I have done this week is mess with my bangs. So it's a real struggle over here at the Albright house, uh, y'all. So <laughs> hey, we all have our issues, right? All the yeah, things yeah, we yeah, have yeah. to deal with. Yep. Yeah. I know. So anyway, y'all have a great week and day. And uh, here is Aaron because it's a great interview. Here's Aaron. Yeah. Well, today we are really excited to talk with Aaron P.T. Canning. Hi, Aaron. How are you? I'm doing all right. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, we're glad you're here. Thank you for making the time to be here. I love talking about writing. So it's always, (laughs) this is, this is what energizes me for the rest of the day. That's awesome. (laughs) All right. So here's Aaron's bio. 
Uh, Erin is a book editor, fiction author, and host of the Parents Who Write podcast. Erin P.T. Canning is a book editor, fiction author, and host of the Parents Who Write podcast. After donating six years of her life to motherhood, she published the fantasy romance novel Ruins and Redemption. She earned her M.A. in writing from Johns Hopkins University and lives with her husband and two boys in Maryland, USA. That's awesome. Wow, that's amazing. Well, tell us how you got into writing. You know, I feel like it's an answer that you probably have heard many times. (laughs) Um, But for me, it originated as a child with escapism. Mm -hmm. I needed a world where I felt like I had power. And Mm -hmm. I was always drawn to the types of stories where the character could dig down deep and discover they had what they needed all along the hero's journey. Uh, and rise above whatever challenges they were facing. And um, I I had my challenges in childhood. I mean, we all do, let's face it. Um, But writing was my way to be the best version of myself and where I had that power. Um, And honestly, it's still the same for me today. You know, that's uh, escapism. I took a break from writing for a really long time, but I started up again when about, oh oh my God, the time is like, now the years are blurring together for me. But I started (laughs) writing again about, right? I started writing again about three-ish years ago and um, it it started again with that escapism. No offense to my children. I love them profusely. I unexpectedly became an at-home mom and I had undiagnosed anxiety, undiagnosed ADHD, undiagnosed depression, and I didn't realize um, what I was getting myself into and it got worse. And so writing what became my way to get out of that. And and yeah, but the biggest shock for me was that when I got back into writing, it was actually with creative nonfiction and I had never done Mm -hmm. creative nonfiction before that but it became my way of processing things. Huh. Mm-hmm. That is interesting. So did you move from that into fiction later? I did. So the first stuff that I started writing about and I published on my blog and I hated everything that I wrote because I felt my, like my writing skills had atrophied. I thought writing had, was a past version of myself. Um, but everything I started writing in the beginning was about my father disowning me, fun times. Mm-hmm. Um, and how my anxiety or I had never been a parent who yelled at my kids until I had my second child. And then I was screaming all the time. And what I discovered is that anger masks anxiety. So Mm. a lot of that writing was about me coming to terms with that and understanding what was going on and processing. And once I got all of that out of my system, my fictional character started talking to me again. And I was like, oh, what do you know? still a fiction writer that's so exciting (laughs) that's amazing that's amazing I love that because you know I mean we all have those I hate to use the word blocks but but it is kind of a block you know for whatever reason and and they come sometimes seasonally and um you know so I love that you were able to process through that and then get back to your fiction writing yeah it's interesting how much writing became necessary for me and I noticed that when I made the time to write I was better able to be there for my kids Mm. rather than me being like no I'm supposed to be the perfect parent and put them first all the time and then I had nothing left to give them but yeah when I made my writing a priority I was happier and they got a happier mama so Mm. everybody's happier which makes everybody everybody happier yeah yeah Yeah. exactly (laughs) Well, exactly. just, I know this is a huge topic, but just quickly, if there's someone who is, this is in this situation and they're like, how did you write out of your, how did your writing help you through this mm-hmm. time? Do you have any, any advice for them? What you put down on paper does not mean that's who you are. Mm. I wrote some stuff that I held on to deep inside those fears of, you know, is it that I hate being a parent? Is it that I was never cut out to do this or what's wrong with me? Like those deep seated fears that can just eat away at you. And when I was able to put them on paper and just let it go, I realized 
no, that's not actually who I am. I don't really feel that way. Right. But by able to by being able to acknowledge it, I could release it rather mm-hmm. than just keep trying to push it down more and more. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I I recently found a, a journal that I had been writing in before I quit the day job. Well, actually it was it was like a year before because and I was at a different stage with my job than I was when I actually quit. And um it was before I had published and I was so unbelievably miserable in that job. I mean, just miserable. And I was mad at everyone, mad at my husband that he didn't say, well, honey, just quit. Even though he sort of had said that, Mm -hmm. I didn't think we, I could, you know, and, um, and I said some, I mean, like I got, I threw it away. Like I threw it away. I would never want anyone to read that because I said some things that I don't really mean, but at the right. time I had to get it, get it out. And it did help. It, it did help. It helped me get up in the morning, get that crap out of my head, go to work and then come home and do it all again the next day. But yeah, I just would never want him or my children or anyone else to read some of the things I said, because they did, they weren't who I was but they were who I was at the time. Yeah. So yeah, those feelings that you have they're they come from somewhere, you know? And so if you can dig into it, then you can find out what the root cause is and address it. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's a lot of what my early writing was. And I was like, Oh, wow. But I also had fun with the creed, the, the, um, creative nonfiction to being able to turn it into a story. I had, a traumatic birth with my first child that Mm -hmm. I never allowed myself to process until I was pregnant with the second one. And I had a panic attack going into the hospital. Um, And that one of the first pieces that I wrote at 28 weeks when reality shifts was me finally sitting down and just the piece oscillates back and forth between the red flags that started to appear when I was getting my sonogram and uh, my brain trying to process it. Like mm-hmm. when my doctor was like, you, you, you need to go into the hospital like right now. And I was like, no, 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 we, we left the paint cans out. Like, cause we <laughs> were in the middle of painting the nursery. So like, we gotta, we just, we just have the rollers wrapped in a plastic wrap, you know, like yeah. we gotta go finish we gotta that go home. Come back, yeah. Yeah. Right. And she's like, no, no, sweetheart. You're, you're going into the hospital now. And I was like, oh, um, and so it was hard writing that piece, but it was so good to just like, get it out of my system. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how writing helps, you know, yourself or understand yourself. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Well, um, so you've moved, you've moved more into fiction writing. Now you write mostly fiction. So I'm sure things have changed over time, but what is your definition of success? Oh, I love that one. Um, so what I find interesting about that is that my definition of success changes with each new goal that I create. Mm -hmm. Um, I I used to have a really bad problem of only looking forward and seeing all the things that I have yet to do. And that would feel very overwhelming and I haven't achieved enough. And then I had a mentor who taught me to actually start looking backwards Uh, and acknowledge all of the stuff I had done. And I was like, oh my God, I I have done a lot. And they're like, yeah, I know. Stop beating yourself up. So for me... My next, my, my definition of success is whatever just that next goal is while also acknowledging what I previously achieved. So Mm. right now, my next definition of success is finishing the rough draft for book three, because I am releasing book two on February 2nd. It's done. So I want to celebrate that, but I'm also like, oh, I've got, you know, 120,000 words to write for book three. Woot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's my that's my definition right now. I just need to finish that draft. Yeah. I think that's but, smart. I think yeah. that's smart. I think it keeps you grounded and and more focused. It's yeah. it's less because a lot of times our goals are very um arbitrary and subjective. Like, you know, it's hard to measure them, but finishing something is that's a tangible goal, you know, so that that's easier to to hang yeah. on to. Yeah. 
yeah, I try to focus on those smart goals. And I do have a big goal for 2024. It's to grow my author business. And I've broken that down into manageable steps. One of those is for me to get more knowledgeable about the indie author publishing business. So Mm -hmm. I can talk about it more um, wisely. (laughs) Um, I've never been a business person, so that feels daunting, but that's, Mm -hmm. that's part of it. And then I have a schedule for releasing my books this year. So again, as long as I'm releasing those books on schedule and doing my best, to me, I'm good. Okay. That's good. Well, what do you wish you'd known about writing and craft? Oh, I love that question. (laughs) Um, Freedom to write crap. Sorry. Is that word okay on the air? Okay. (laughs) Okay. Um, So I loved getting my master's in writing. I love the craft of writing. I love talking about techniques. I love, especially when you can write a scene or you're describing a setting and you're conveying emotion through the setting. I love being able to do those kinds of things. But I left my master's program not knowing how to finish a shitty first draft. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. And that stumped me for about 20 years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I had this additional layer of pressure on myself because I was, Mm -hmm. I still am a professional editor. Mm -hmm. And while I'm telling my clients Mm -hmm. to just write the crappy first draft, I myself could not do it because I was like, no, I've got like, people can't see me writing that. I'm a professional. And it was terrifying. Mm -hmm. So when I finally, 20 years later. And so this is now, you know, a couple of years ago, I was just tired of putting my dreams on hold. Mm -hmm. I've helped so many other people get their writing out there. And I love doing that. In fact, helping editors, no, helping authors with their work made me a stronger writer. So I love that, but it was my turn. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And so I finally, I, I, had the characters talking to me in my head and it was a funny scene about the character finally just said I'm the potato (laughs) and I couldn't stop laughing and um I was like okay I have 10 minutes because I'm about to head out the door with the kids I just need to write down that bit about I'm the potato and I because I had such a tiny time frame to get it in I gave myself permission to write crap and it was just so freeing. And from that moment on, that's that's where the first draft for Ruins and Redemption came from. I daydreamed that story for like four months. It started as a dream and I couldn't let go of it. And um, and it just kept playing in my head. And when I finally hit the line about I'm a potato, which is not in Ruins and Redemption, but that was where it started. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I sat down and, and 110,000 words poured out of me within... Wow. 12 weeks, I think it was. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Sometimes oh, so. it's just that one little phrase or idea or character that will unlock things. And once yes. you find that, then sometimes it's best just to run with it. But it sounds like uh, you've done a lot of like the incubating that Becca mm-hmm. Syme talks about where you're thinking about things and, you know, you kind of know, but you've got to get over that hurdle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And once I got over that hurdle, The first draft for Runes and Redemption, that was 110,000 words. Um, When I started revising it, then it doubled in size. So that actually became book one and book two. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, yeah, yeah. And then I did NaNoWriMo and that was 50K for book three. So So you were off and running then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what about marketing? What do you wish you'd known about marketing? Oh, marketing. I took notes on the side because I knew that I'd be like, oh, what? And I'm like, okay, what is it again? Right. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is it. I was like, that is a good one. Um, yeah. Resources. Mm. I felt very overwhelmed when I started off with marketing because again, that idea of, like I said, one of my big goals this year is to really get to know the indie author publishing industry and how that works and there's so many different ad courses out there. And, you know, do you go with mm-hmm. Facebook or do you go with Amazon? Mm-hmm. And how do you use the algorithms to your advantage? And that can get very overwhelming. So right. I'm fortunate that I'm part of 
a coaching mastermind run by All Right Well, and I'm starting to tackle, we're starting off actually with a Facebook ad for our reader magnet, and then we're going to move into Amazon ads. Um, and it's somebody that I know and trust. So like, I, I know I'm going to get what I need from here, but I just wish that I had known how many resources were available when I first started mm-hmm. writing. How many times as writers, like we think, oh, I'm going to write a book and we don't actually think about what comes after that. Yeah. And right. And I fell into that category as well. Um, and so I just wish that I had been more knowledgeable about how ads work and mm-hmm. who the big players are that could help me um hit the ground running when I got started. Right. Right. That's great. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. What assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? Oh, I love that. That's such a great question. So 20 years ago, my assumption was that I had to perfect each chapter before I moved on to the next one. And this came from being in the creative writing program with my master's because when you're submitting your work, usually a chapter at a time for critique among your peers, you stress over making it as perfect as possible. And that's what created that pressure on myself that it had to be perfect before I could move on. Right. Right. So that proved wrong, like (laughs) horribly wrong. And I wish that we had been given permission to write crap for those chapters so we could learn what a revision, what what that first draft looks like and be okay with it and then see how it evolves over time rather than just, okay, submit us a chapter and make sure it's as perfect as possible and then we'll comment on it. Mm -hmm. Um, that, That would have been an amazing experience to be able to see the progression of other people's first drafts. I wish famous authors would release their first drafts so we could also see that and be like, (laughs) (laughs) right? Uh, Yeah. Well, Um, have you, I have seen like old, old, old books or notes from people who used to do typing, like they would type out their manuscripts and some of the scribbles and stuff that I've seen are just amazing. Like there is like a ton of revision and imagine doing all of that with a typewriter just like blows my mind. But I would, yeah, I th- I don't know that people now would release that because we you know right? we just have all these clean drafts every time we do our mm-hmm. edits, you know? Mm-hmm. I remember yeah. watching the newest version of Little Women and they showed Joe writing her book and laying all the pages out on the attic floor. Yes. And I was like, oh my God, I can't imagine yeah. trying to yeah. organize it like that. I got yeah. a little bit of a panic attack when I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was like, oh no, my brain would not be able to do. No. Yeah. No. Nope. <laughs> um, and then the second part to that question actually is... Um, because I started writing again, I had another assumption and it was that, um, it was the definition of literary fiction. Uh. And, um, and the idea that literary fiction can't be done quickly. Mm -hmm. That was a big misconception for me. And I, again, I, I love the craft of writing itself. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have to take three years to write one book. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And also it doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah, I talked about, I talk about, you know, what such a great education I got from the critique group I was in and the the women who really mentored me. And, but I will say one of the, the only thing I can really think of that wasn't um, positive. It wasn't negative either, but you know, it was that idea of you really need to toil over this and make it perfect. And so therefore it takes a long time to write Mm -hmm. a book. And so Mm -hmm. in my head, I still have that thinking of a book written quickly for me is not going to be a good book and not for anyone else. And everyone else can write their books quickly and I think they're great. But for me, a book written quickly can't be great. And that's not true, but it is ingrained in me. And I have to fight against that a lot of the time. That was ingrained in me for 20, 30 years. Yeah. I completely yeah. understand. Yeah. And but it was stumping me so much to the point yes. that I was doing nothing. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I had to let go of that idea. And it was just, it was nice because when I gave myself the freedom, like I said, to write crap, I mm. noticed that my writing was actually much better right. because I had that creativity to be myself. Right. And I was like, oh, it's actually, it's not bad. Like, I, I right. really right. love what I'm writing. This is amazing. And I figured out my revision mm. process so that I can really strengthen that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was a big one to overcome. Yeah. 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 I think all writers, to some extent, we struggle with like perfectionism and wanting to make it the best we can. And you have to figure out where the point is, where it's, because I don't think that a manuscript is ever going to be perfect, mm -hmm. but you have to get it to the point that you're happy with it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's like, you've got to find that. And when you're first starting out, that's really difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, what is the most important lesson you've learned? Ooh. Okay. What was my note on that one? <laughs> Oh, right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, that was a good one. All right. See, I knew it. That's why I was like, I knew that I would just blank all of a sudden. So I was like, right now, I was like, oh, yeah, that was a good one. Um, okay. Knowing and embracing my genre. Mm. Mm. Uh, when I, so I got my BA in Lit from American University. And when I was, you know, studying literature, <laughs> university level you know it's it's the canon it's all the dead white men um I had some amazing classes with women authors and um so world literature classes which I loved but I started looking down on fantasy mm. and that was my passion as a child that's what got me to love writing and reading in the first place yeah uh, no that's not literature um and thank goodness that I was with my friend Brian and we were walking through DC and he was telling me all about Harry Potter and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe and Lord of the Rings and he would not stop like he was in full geek out mode and I love him for that and um he, he pushed me to the point where we went into a bookstore and they had Harry Potter on sale it was a buy two, get one 50% off kind of a deal. So I wound up going home with the first three books. I had sworn I would never read this series. Yeah. And um, and I fell in love yeah. by the time I got to the third book. First one, I was like, eh, okay. Second one, I was like, that's kind of cool. Third one, I was like, I love this. I need to go get book four. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it just reminded me who I was. Mm -hmm. So it's holding on to that. And then when I finally really embraced my genre, it was looking at what are the tropes and understanding that and not being beholden to the tropes, but understanding how to make them my own mm -hmm. yeah. while still meeting readers' expectations. Right, right. Ooh, can you give us an example of that? That sounds cool. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a good one. Um, like, it's funny when you work backwards. So my reader magnet is a short story. It's 11,000 words. You can get it on my website. And it's called Promises and Possibilities. And I just wrote the story because I loved it. And then I had to go back and be like, uh, okay, so what tropes apply to this one? And it yeah. was really hard to figure out. Right. Whereas... I've seen other writers where they're like, okay, I've done so many X, Y, Z tropes. I think this time I want to do an age gap story. Right. And I'm like, huh? Okay. Um, and they're not creating some sort of campy, cheesy book. It's just, that's giving them an idea to start with. Mm -hmm. And when you understand, like, why is an age gap story, why does that appeal to readers, what's interesting about it, and then you start thinking about it, you're like, oh, you know what, I can visualize two characters who would fall into that category, and this is what they'd be struggling with, and this is their right. internal struggle and their external struggle, and um, so it's it's not... Uh, it's not like you're making a book according to a recipe. It's yeah. more like you're just getting these ideas for ingredients. And you're like, you know what? That would be a fun one to play with. Yeah. And then it helps you to change it up so you're not writing the same thing over and over again if you keep right. that in mind. So that's pretty fun too. Did that answer your question? Yeah. That's yeah, great. that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's the biggest change you've had to make in your thinking besides writing the first, you can write a crappy first draft and... The previous answer. Do you have any other changes in your thinking you've had to make? Yes. Being an author can be a career. Yeah. That was a huge change yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, thanks to a lot of the writers that I've been hanging out with and I've been visiting the 20 books to 50k Facebook group and seeing how Mm -hmm. other writers do it. And I'm not going to go the method of rapid release. I don't have that in me. That's when people release six to eight books a year. And I'm just like, I I would be burned out. Like, I don't No, Thank you. I'm going to take more time so that I can write what I really love. Um, And that works for them. That is perfectly fine. I was like, that's, that's a little too hardcore for me. But I realized that my goal is to release four books a year. Mm, okay. And I've learned how that is doable thanks to the program that I'm in all right well and how to stagger your cover design and making sure you've got your blurb ready. And so it's it's not just working on one book at a time from start to finish. There's an right. overlap in there and that makes it easier to do it more compressed. Right. Mm-hmm. And when I learned how to do that, that was when I realized this can actually be a career, but it requires that mindset shift of, you know, I don't feel like writing today. The muse hasn't hit me. And it's like, no, the muse has to, like, I'm going to tell the muse to show up because I've got a deadline and I've got (laughs) words that I need to do because I want this to be my career. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Well, you mentioned there writing four books a year and you're a parent and one of the things that we had talked about that we could delve into is writing while being a busy stay-at-home and working mom. So what are your tips around that? How have you uh, cracked that code? That was a fun one. You know, um, (laughs) I have a quote that I associate with parents who write, and it's, I'm not allowed to do the dishes until I sit down and write for at least 10 minutes. Oh, that's and, I like that personally. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I feel like it does apply to everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was that mindset shift of my writing is just as important as everything else that I'm doing for my family, if not mm-hmm. slightly more because of the fact that it makes me a better person. Right. And it's not that I'm lowering my kids' priorities down or my husband down on my list and elevating myself to the top. It's more that I'm finally balancing them. And I'm acknowledging I need this. Right. And so when my kids had screen time, that was not my time to do dishes and clean the house and pick up their toys. Mm -hmm. If my kids were having screen time, I was writing. Mm -hmm. That became my time. Yeah. Um, I was blessed with my first child that he would give me a glorious three-hour nap. I know it was amazing. It never (laughs) happened again. My second child was like, nope, half hour later, and no big brother is playing, and I am going down there to play too. Like that was that was gone. Um, <laughs> but one of one of the things that I learned to do was to get an hourly schedule for my day and then block off the times that I knew were impossible for me to write. So mm-hmm. right now that's you know, eight o'clock till nine o'clock with getting the kids to school. I can't change that. There is no block yeah. in there. Right. Uh, dinner time with the kids coming home from school. That's like four o'clock till six o'clock yeah. and eight o'clock hour is bedtime. And um, so by blocking those out, I then could look at the holes that were left in my schedule. And then based on those holes, I would set three main priorities for myself for the day. It's that rock, paper, sand theory. If you guys are mm-hmm. familiar with that, mm-hmm. uh, where if you put the sand in the jar first, there's no room for the rocks. But if you put the rocks in first, there's yeah. always room for sand. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so I would pick my big three rocks. And one of those for me was writing. And then the other two were the things that just had to get done that day. And yeah. anything else that got done that day was a bonus. But I wasn't going to drive myself insane trying to do everything on my to-do list because it's impossible. That to-do list right. is endless. Right. So I had to bump up my writing in order to make it happen. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah, that's a very smart way to look at it. Yeah. And I think we all have things that are like the sand in our lives that can just like take over everything. For me lately, it's email. It's like you could spend all day doing email. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <It's>, email. <laughs> I, know. Yeah. I have a love-hate relationship with it. Yeah. yeah. So, but that's very smart. And I think that's, the way to tackle it is these are the priorities and I'll get to this other stuff eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And giving yourself that permission, like that was massive to say, I'm not being selfish. 
that I'm choosing to write while my kids are watching TV and the dishes are sitting in the sink. Mm -hmm. My house isn't going to explode because I got to my dishes later. And honestly, I'd rather be doing the dishes when my kids are playing because like as much as I love playing with my kids, there's only so much that I can take of Mm-hmm. me pretending that we're in Minecraft world. Mm-hmm. So it's like, great. I played with you guys. I love you. We've bonded. We've connected. Awesome. I'm going to go do dishes. And they're like, oh, mom's doing dishes. I'm going to go do something else. I'm like, yes, you do that. So um, yeah, when I'm with my grandkids, like I get really tired of being big beat at the mem- uh, memory game, the memory card game. Like there's <laughs> something really demoralizing about three and five-year-olds beating you at the memory game. So uh I walk away. I walk away. I empathize with that. I empathize with that. Well, let's talk about Sarah. Did I choke you up? Okay, I'm unmuted now. I'm good. (laughs) Um, So let's talk about uh, writing out of depression. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, if you know me, you know I've had a year really two years. And so how is, how do you do that? Like how, because really and truly for me, when I started writing, I wrote to escape, like you said, but now it seems really hard. And there's a part of me because grief is involved in my, you know, in all of my stuff that feels a little bit guilty about trying to escape. So what what are your thoughts on just writing out of depression? It is a very complicated thing because I was talking to somebody. She was amazing. Her name is Rachel. Um, and she was saying how it's important to acknowledge that you don't want to re-traumatize yourself. Mm-hmm. So you need to know if you're ready. You can't force yourself to face those things. Right. That's, I mean, I'm always an advocate for therapy. 100%. I had oh, a yeah. therapist. She yep, was yep, yep, yep. Um, so just with that caveat in mind, I don't want people to feel like, oh, I'm failing because I didn't do this. No, um, I'm fortunate that I've always had a constitution where I can sob and type at the same time. Oh, wow. Yep. And sometimes that was like, I, I had a, I, I hit rock bottom when my second was, almost one years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, my other one was, was approaching four. It was Christmas. Mm -hmm. I was baking, touch my microphone. I was baking my sixth batch of Christmas cookies. I don't know what I was thinking. It was crazy. Um, that, that I'm not going to get into the soapbox on the pressure of making the perfect holiday for your family. But, um, my kids had strewn all the toys on the living room floor. I mean, and I'm an organizational nut. So they even took apart all the little bags and all the little separated pieces and took them apart. It looked like a bomb went off in the living room Yeah, and I lost it. I was screaming. Like my kids had drove the car through the entire house and I picked up my four-year-old and I screamed in his face. My spit was flying onto his face and um and he just had this look pass over his face like i don't care i'm mm-hmm. done mm-hmm. and i flashed back to my dad doing that to me mm. and i remembered thinking back then i hate sorry i remember thinking back then i hate you mm. and i put my kid down and i sobbed hysterically and i went to the computer while crying and i googled mom lost identity depression mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. what is going on here and that's what set me on the course i found uh dana abraham's calm the chaos and she mm-hmm. was doing a free weekly workshop a free week long uh workshop on facebook that was called find your spark and i was like yes i need to find my spark there's nothing mm-hmm. left inside me yeah, yeah. um i don't know who i am now anymore you know those kind of mm-hmm. stuff and i uh, i did her course and at the end of that Lo and behold, it revealed I'm still a writer. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? I thought that died. Like when I had my first kid, what? Um, And so it's kind of the same thing with when I'm really depressed. I just know that if I can get it on the page, Mm. it changes my thinking. Like I've had journal entries where it started off with me 
complaining and saying every horrible thing about how my child was behaving up until the moment where I lost it. Right. And it's all about, he's doing all these things and he's terrible and he hates me. And, you know, why is it that it is this way? But as I'm getting them out, I started looking at like, what was it that he had been dealing with all day? Yeah. Yeah. Changes your perspective. Yeah. It did. It changes my perspective every time. And and then by the time I was done with that, I felt so bad for my son. I was like, of course he snapped. Like, look at everything yeah. he had been dealing with today. Right. And so he and I were able to go repair. I will say my hus- my son and I, uh, our relationship has truly transformed in the last few years. We're still making progress. Mm-hmm. Um, I just need to put that out there. Could you hear me saying that? <laughs> I was screaming at him all the time, this poor kid. Um, and I always apologize to him and we would mm-hmm. talk things out. And so, you know, um, but the point is, it's hard. Like I remember laying in bed and dreading pulling off that blanket and having mm-hmm. to do the same thing again. And I had nothing for myself. Right. Right. And getting myself to the page, sitting down in front of it, it kind of became a habit where if I had my coffee, I had my notebook, I could sit down at the table and I could even just write, I don't want to write today. I've got right. nothing left in me. Right. And that would just kind of start process. Right. Um, but it's, it's not a magic Mm-mm. elixir of like, okay, everybody can do this now. You know, right. it's, it's so hard when you're in the middle of it and I know it, I'm just yeah, yeah. writing about it. Like I've said before, it just helps me to let it go. And it right. takes time. It's not like I'm better immediately after I'm done writing. I've been dealing with depression actually most of the month of January. Mm-hmm. I've been in a darker spell lately. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this time around, I, I sent my pre-order for book three. Like oh. that was terrifying because now the whole day, and like I kind of did it to be like, can I, can I get away with this? Like, is it going to yeah. force me to stick to my right? And so that alone, I was like, I really have to write today because I'm like thirty thousand words behind. Woot! Um, <laughs> and luckily, being in my world and escaping in it helps me, but it's really hard because then when I close the keyboard, I can feel the depression just sink right back on me. Yeah. So I've been, I've been working through it this month. Yeah. Yeah. So the bottom line is try to put some words down, try to put some words down. Yeah. 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 Try. Yeah. Without judgment. Yes. Without judgment. That's the hard part. Yeah. Sometimes. That is the hard part. Yeah, that is. Does it help you to think that like, does it, I'm like, I, there've been times that I'm like, okay, I'm just going to write this down and, and I'll, I can delete it later. Like, or I can, you know, throw away that notebook. Like Jamie said, does that help you to have that? perspective that it's okay I mean in my mind I know I hate throwing away words so I'm probably not gonna throw away (laughs) um if it's fiction or are we talking journaling for journaling and writing myself out of depression when I'm more so focused on that I'm fortunate that my husband is so incredibly supportive and he's heard me say the worst things and he helps he's He's really my rational half. And I love him for that because I can blurt stuff out and he'll talk me through it and be like, okay, cool. Like, Mm -hmm. so having it in the journal has already, through my conversations with him, I've already learned that that's not me. And that workshop that I did about find your spark that also really helped us to realize that what we were writing doesn't make us who we are. Right. So I don't have to throw the journal away. I don't need that anymore. For me, it was the big understanding of just because you wrote that down and that's how you were feeling in that moment in time doesn't mean that's who you are all the time. Right, right. Yeah, makes sense. Well, uh, what about daydreaming the plot before you write? I love that idea. Yeah. That is fun. I love doing that. So I daydreamed Ruins and Redemption, like I said, for about three to four months before I sat down and wrote the first draft. Mm -hmm. And what I found particularly helpful about that is it helped me to kind of think like, okay, well, what is motivating these characters and why are they here in this world? Because like I said, it started with the dream. Mm -hmm. Um, What is it that they want? What are they chasing? What is their baggage? And I could just start 
crafting these daydreams about who they are and where they came from and also how the story would continue. And because I could daydream different scenarios without spending time writing 20 million different versions of a chapter, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I could just daydream it and be like, ooh, I really like how that one would turn out and where that would lead to in the story. And I became really good at daydreaming the same scene over and over again. So that by the time I sat down to write it, it it was embedded in my head very well. So this way, and again, because by the time I would finally sit down to write, I had, prior to having children, I thought writing meant that you had hours to sit in front of a computer and perfect (laughs) every single word that went down. Mm -hmm. Um, That was not my reality anymore. Right. Right. So if I've got 30 minutes, I have to be ready to go by the time I sit down and open that. So I've got the scene. I've played through it in my head. I hear some dialogue. I usually choose a key phrase. That's like a trigger for the scene. Oh, that's Um, Yeah. And if I can hold on to that key phrase, I'll repeat it in my head many, many, many times. Or if I have to, or if I can, I'll open up my notes app and I'll write down that key phrase. Yes. Uh, But I've done it when I'm driving. Oh, I daydream a lot when I'm driving. And (laughs) a little alarming. But uh, if I, if I'll, I'll play that key phrase over and over again in my head so that when I'm ready to sit down, that'll spur the rest of the scene into fruition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. I love that. And I do that too, in many ways. I think, I think through my scenes and I figure out what's the gist of them, you know, and if I can have like a, a phrase or like the first line, then I can, it's easier for me to get going. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I like taking that moment to really think about it before writing, because then I can sink into the feelings that the characters have, Mm -hmm. their body movement, um, what's going on in the setting? Is there something that I could have them doing that would inqu- that would incorporate action as well? So it's not just talking to each other all the time. Um, and and yeah, so if I could just get those pieces in place, then it flows. Yeah. So you also mentioned rethinking the first chapter. Is that sort of trying it out in different ways and maybe changing certain things as you write? So what I found most interesting about the first chapter, uh, and it turns out that a lot of authors do this, my first chapter finally became a placeholder. Mm-hmm. I had rewritten the first chapter. I I tried writing a book series 20 years ago <laughs> when I first went to AU. Still have it. God, I really hope I do write that series one day. My husband asked me about that. Um, <laughs> I was like, someday, dear. Right now, I need to finish the Heritage Saga with Ruins and Redemption. Like Adeline's story is at the forefront right now. but um. Uh, I used to rewrite the first chapter over and over and over again because it just didn't feel right. And for this time, I tried and I was like, it's not right. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to circle over this thing 20 million times. I then left it as a placeholder. And Mm -hmm. as I continued throughout the story and I saw the the threads of where my characters were going, I started making notes at the beginning of the chapter. I kept a bullet list. I'm like, ooh, these are the things that I need to just touch on Mm-hmm. in the first chapter so that you'll see how it plays out throughout the rest of the book because I wanted to create that parallel of where she's at at the beginning of the book versus where she's at the end of the book and so you could see that transformation very clearly mm-hmm. and by keeping an eye on it and then just putting in the bullet list by the time I was done with the book I was ready to write that first chapter and it oh. was easier so much easier to like make it the way I really wanted it to and what I needed to capture with her Right. Because I knew what I, you know, once you know where you, they're going to be, it was easier mm-hmm. to write where she started right. emotionally. Yeah. That's some um, advanced maneuver, <laughs> writer maneuver right there. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's funny because I have, you know, I was, I always tell my clients like celebrate your, your bad review, right? It means mm-hmm. you're a real writer yeah. when you finally, so I have one bad review for my <clears> book <throat> and it made me laugh because The bad review was like, I like, don't bother reading this unless you want to know all about anthropology. And she's an anthropologist. My main character is an anthropologist. Okay. Back where where I said an anthropologist unintentionally travels to another world. Like, um, but her being an anthropologist is 
what makes her it, it's how she relates to this other world that she travels to right right, so right. it's a core part of her identity i can't skip yeah. over her being an anthropologist <laughs> it's not like she's sitting there giving a lecture for the first 10 hours right. of the book <laughs> welcome to anthropology 101 no like she's oh, being in a cave funny. and you know like and there's just these little touchstones of what she's going through because her her grandmother just passed away and she has no more family left and she's going through those emotions while she's working. Um, and all of that sets up her journey. Yes. So, yes. yeah. That's just, sorry, it still makes me crack up. That's funny. That's funny. Well, it's been awesome having you here. I've enjoyed this interview so much. Uh, tell us what you think you've done, the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success. Oh, I love that. Um, prioritizing my writing. My writing. Yeah. Yeah. while still seeking knowledge and and it's been interesting with that balance because mm -hmm. i try to get my writing in earlier in the day if possible because right. we get done Life. what we do first right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah um i am a night owl though so there's plenty of times where i'm writing from 8 until 10:30 at night yeah but my my biggest setup for success is that because I can prioritize my writing, I am also making that time in my day to also learn. Yes. You know, I didn't want to just go into a hole where like I have to spend the next three months only trying to write book three, but I'm also trying to dip into, like I said, 20 books to 50 K or, yeah. you know, checking out what book funnel has to offer or right. following Atticus and seeing what they're suggesting and not getting overwhelmed and all of that. But it's like those touch points throughout the week where it's like, okay, right. what sure. is going on? So I can keep learning and growing. That's yeah. awesome. So smart. So yeah. smart. Yeah. Well, tell everyone where they can find you and your podcast. And you have a group for writing parents, right? I do. Yeah. In Facebook. I have the Parents Who Write Facebook group that coincides with my podcast. And um, I would say anybody who really likes what they were hearing, if they want to hear more of that, then go to your search bar and type in Parents Who Write. Come take a look. And, uh, yeah. And what's your, what's your website? My website, erinptcanning.com. That's a okay. lot of letters. I know. I know. That's <laughs> okay. Erin, yeah. E-R-I-N. And then the P is for Patricia. The T is for Teresa Canning, like a canning factory, um, dot com. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we will have Very those good. links in the show notes. So thank you yeah. so much for being here. It was big. Thanks great. for coming and being here and sharing your wisdom. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Like I said, sure. I love being able to talk about writing and be able to pass this knowledge forward to help the yeah. next person. Great. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll have those notes in the, those links in the show notes. And thanks to Alexa Larberg for editing and producing the podcast and Adriel Wiggins for joining the admin. And if you want to support the podcast, if you receive value from it and would like to support us, you can find the link at wishidknownforwriters.com slash support. See everybody next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.